Okay. So yeah, second talk of the morning. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I like this atmosphere of a small workshop with a friendly faces, and uh, I'm all the happier that actually it's the first workshop in person that we have on this effort on projects, which was one of the most successful projects of my scientific life, actually. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to be here and indeed to explore what can be the, the follow-ups of what we did together. Um, and so uh, the title of the talk is Bipartite Quantum Energetics. So I, I guess it's, it's kind of in the scope of the workshop because we all decided to put temperature, to throw it out of the window. And I was so happy to see that on the slides. Since it's been a chorus, I, I sing for a while now. And uh, so just a bit of, of introduction first. Um, so that's the group I shamelessly abandoned in Grenoble. That's uh, the last day in Grenoble I, I spent. And uh, now we, we live a very posh life because we meet in France, we meet, meet in Singapore, and we meet in California. So thanks for this also. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we recently picked a name. That's the quantum energy team like that. And uh, in this group, we actually do lots of things with the uh, energetics uh, in front of it. So energetics of quantum measurement, which is basically the topic of, of the meeting, but also energetics of quantum optics, quantum information, and quantum technologies, which is what I will explain a bit more tonight. And uh, yeah, so some of, uh, of uh, my students are, are here, and I'm, and I'm ha quite happy to see them. <clears throat> and yeah, yeah. Applications welcome because I said I left to Singapore and now I'm sad and alone. <laughs> so if what I'm saying is of any of interest to you, I don't hesitate to, uh, to, to, to apply because uh, there are some positions open. Okay, so I'm going actually to rephrase what you said and I promise we did not synchronize before. Uh, what is one of energetics? So instead of having a KB that is uh, <laughs> erased, this is a, a thermometer. And uh, so also, I, I would define it the same way. It is a little cousin of, of quantum thermodynamics um, with this idea that actually uh, we don't need temperature to define the relevant concepts, actually. And so the purpose of quantum energetics is to explore the relations between energy, entropy, and information flows in the quantum realm. And uh, here, the, the basic thing that, that matters is that we don't have any temperature anymore, but we have a source of entropy that can be specifically quantum. And this source of entropy, everything that we uh, did so far, that was quantum measurement, but actually we can think about any kind of quantum noise. And we all know there is a zoo of possible quantum noise that can serve as a resource. Okay. So um, what are the motivations of this um, emerging field? So I just said it, quantum noise as a resource is something that is uh, interesting. So, uh, and the equivalent in usual thermodynamics is can turn it into work. There is another uh, field that is currently getting strongly consolidated, which is the, the field of quantum batteries. And quantum batteries, it is very cool because from day one, they had no temp temperature to deal with. It's just about uh, optimizing energy flows between systems. So they are really in the scope. Um, and so basically that's for the first law. And then for the second law, uh, since we have to rebuild all the concepts without temperature, we have to define and quantify what quantum irreversibility is. We can go through quantum fluctuation theorems, and then we can relate first and second law via this idea of minimal work costs, bound and efficiencies. So that's basically the roadmap of quantum energetics, which is basically stolen from thermodynamics, but again, uh, using a new dice as the, the source of perturbation and fluctuation. So a few examples of what we can do in quantum energetics. So we saw with Andrew, there are these measurement back actions, uh, powered engines, where actually the, the source of quantum noise is the, the classical measurement itself, and the mere fact that when you measure a system, you, you induce perturbation on it. There is something that uh, is also a very big interest, which is the coupling to a, a non-equilibrium reservoir, where also the temperature is not defined. And uh, you find some uh, people who would call that driven dissipative systems, where, again, everything has to be rebuilt. 
And uh, the fact is that with these two like paradigmatic situations, we are dealing with open systems. So in open systems, uh, one problem that we face in the, in the community, or uh, I will rephrase it, it's not a problem, it's, it's a proof of the, how the community is vivid and, and the concepts are, are, are interesting. There are big debates about if we can call this and that kit of work. And typically, uh, the measurement energy that we have dealt with as, as a fuel for quantum engines, we don't know if it can be called quantum kit. That was the first uh, concept that was put on the table a few years ago with this idea that actually it's, a, it's an irreducible source of noise that we find in the quantum uh, world. But uh, it quickly appeared that this concept uh, was very fragile with respect to interpretations of quantum physics. And depending the idea you have on the quantum postulate, then you would feel like calling this heat, or you would feel like calling this work, or a, a little bit of both, or something completely different. So there is no like consensus, and I'm not, I don't think there will be any someday unless we solve the problem of the measurement posture, which is another possibility. But uh, for me, this is really entire, intimately connected, the, the, the debates between heat and work and the interpretations of quantum mechanics. So actually with, uh, with the very brave students that I had the, the, the luck to, to, to have in my group, we came with another idea and uh, credit to Fatris Kamati, who is not here, but uh, we thought about uh, picking up a, a simpler situation in terms of a potential agreement which is the study of a global point of view. Uh, instead of picking, trying to define heat and work on a quantum open system, just like a system that is measured, you pick a bipartite isolated quantum system. So basically two systems, A and B, that are uh, interacting via a time independent Hamiltonian. And uh, so we have global energy conservation, on this system because it is isolated. And the idea is uh, they are getting entangled globally, but if you look at them locally, they have uh, received some entropy, which is the entanglement entropy. So they have exchanged energy, and at the same time, they receive some entropy by the mere fact that they, 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 they interact, they get entangled, but we look at them locally. So the idea that we have is, can we try to define work-like and heat-like concepts? Can we, can we try to, to, to analyze the energy and entropy flows between these systems? And then, does this have an operational value? In other words, can we measure these heat-like and work-like quantities? And can we extract some quantum signatures of it, which has been the goal of quantum thermodynamics for a while? What well, is quantum in quantum thermodynamics is something that we were hearing a lot in conferences a few years ago. So um, there are precedents to these ideas in these three uh, pioneering papers, I would say. And this one is uh, in late stage of writing. And uh, I mean, all the group is in, uh, is in it. So everyone can answer questions. If I cannot answer questions about the calculations, very, very good. Because I did exactly what I said uh, you not to do, which is uh, I tell them not to put equations, and here is full equation all over the place. So, <laughs> anyway, so uh, let's go slowly. Uh, we have this bipartite system. Uh, so we have this A B systems. A B is closed and isolated. The dynamics is ruled by some time independent Hamiltonian and uh, by a, a Liouville equation. So the idea is that there is, again, no external energy input. It's a total, uh, it's an autonomous system. So the total energy is conserved during the interaction. And now what we have is that we can split the energy term into local energies and a coupling term. And all along this talk, what we will pick is um, uh, thermal conditions in the sense that the global Hamiltonian uh, does not exchange, uh, does not that's commute, sorry, with the coupling term. So the net result is that actually everything <laughs> is happening, like the two systems, they are simply exchanging energy with each other. And we want to characterize the nature of these energy exchanges. 
So for this, we need to derive the bipartite dynamics. So we pick again our Hamiltonian, and now we 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 split actually the quantum state of the system in a product state and in a correlation term, and the decomposition is unique. And then we derive the dynamical equation for each for each party, which has the following shape, and it splits basically into a term uh, which is Hamiltonian, which corresponds to an effective Hamiltonian that is induced by the other party on the first one. And that results actually from something you could call a force of B on L. And this force, uh, well, there is a force from B on A and the force from A on B. And then there is another term, which uh, despite it's written like a D, it's not a dissipator. Huh? And uh, it's entirely due to the fact that the two guys, they get correlated and we look at them locally. So this guy is responsible for the entropy change of, the, of each uh, local system. Okay, so that's, uh, and that's not a master equation. This, this is really uh, a translation of the fact that there is some entanglement and we can, we just look at part of the system. Now, uh, let's switch to energy. So um, let's try to keep this idea in mind that we want to derive work-like and kit-like quantities. So what do we have as a, as a limit case? So, consistency check. We can pick the case where actually B becomes so big, big not being defined, but so big being classical, like the guy does never get entangled with A, which means classical in the uh, Heisenberg, uh, in the Heisenberg complementarity uh, perspective. So if B is in this classical state, then there is by definition no entanglement. Then it means that the correlation matrix is zero. And then it means that A solely evolves under the effective Hamiltonian. So we recover the usual unitary transformation when you are driven by your classical mm -hmm. system. And then it means that the energy change induced by this unitary drive, if there is one point where we agree in quantum thermodynamics is that this is work. So on this, there is no problem at all. So this guy is work. And from there, we are actually put a definition on the table, which is that work will be defined as the energy exchange that is induced by this effective Hamiltonian. So that is our first bit of, of definition is in this uh, new framework. Then uh, we can go back to the, uh, to the, to the uh, I would say, uh, more general viewpoint where B is not classical. And then what we have is that the energy of A it can be split into a term which involves the product state and a term which involves the correlation matrix. And when we, we take the time derivative of this, we have this term, which exactly corresponds to what I've shown on the former slide, which corresponds to the bipartite work that is received by A and that is induced by this effective Hamiltonian that comes from the force from B to A. And here, the, the new part here, this is, uh, this is what we call bipartite heat that is received by A, and that comes from the mere fact that the two systems, they get correlated, okay? So that's the two definitions we propose to, to start with. And uh, now that we uh, have this set of definitions, we can start studying the properties. We, like I said at the beginning, are in the situation where we commutes with the total Hamiltonian, so it commutes with the sum of the local Hamiltonian. And in that case, what you can show with uh, some calculations is that the flows of work, they exactly compensate each other, which is very, I found very cool because I see a, like a quantum translation of the action-reaction principle. And also we get a symmetry in that work concept because before we were just talking about work received by a system and here we see where it comes from. It comes from the other guy, which also receives some work. So I find it like very uh, satisfying uh, in terms of, uh, of symmetry. So what I uh, suggest now, and this will have some follow-ups by Maria and then Samia tomorrow, is to uh, pick these definitions and to apply them to the case of light-matter interaction. 
light matter interaction will be our test bed, first to check if we recover some well-known situation, and then to propose an experiment. And then at the end of this uh, talk, I have some experimental slide, which is very moving because it had been a while I had not presented an experiment. So I will try not to say too much crap, but anyway, so that, that will be the, the, the proof that actually bipartite work and heat, they are measurable quantities, and they have been indeed measured in the lab using this uh, framework. Okay, so first of all, what is waveguide QED? So waveguide QED, another way to define it, which is uh, maybe as obscure, is one-dimensional atom. It is a one-dimensional atom. So usually it's what, uh, it's a qubit that is coupled to a reservoir of light mode that propagates in only one dimension. So that's the bread and butter of input-output theory, if you like. So you have pulses of light that propagate you know, here, they find the qubit and they get out. And here I'm going to use also a very simple setting where you can call it half 1D, where actually this guy, it, it can only be reflected after it being interacting with the qubit. So there is one, one input port and one input output port and best, okay? So the input field, it can be the vacuum, can be coherent pulses, can be quantum pulses, thermal light, uh, all the zoo. And the applications, they are really numerous because you can, uh, with this, if you are able to play with these kind of systems in your lab, you can engineer single photon sources, qubit light interfaces, because you can use the giant optical nonlinearity or the giant, giant care medium, etc. And so there are actually two favorite uh, platforms to uh, implement these kind of systems. There are integrated uh, photonics devices like quantum dots that would be trapped inside the microkiller, which is a directional cavity. That's uh, one type of one-dimensional atom that we can play with. And the experiment I'm going to present will be impl is implemented, was implemented with that uh, device. The other obvious framework uh, or, or platform are superconducting qubits. So that's the end of Benjamin. That's why I mentioned uh, Benjamin Huard, but uh, we are also catered here uh, with the uh, dignified representative of superconducting qubits in, in, the, in this room. So we, we play with these two kinds of platforms for, to, to implement a waveguide purity experiment. And so we are still in a theory talk. So what is the standard modeling uh, for waveguide QD? Usually we use the quantum open system approach. Okay, So we basically write down dynamical equations where the qubit is on the one hand and the light is on the other hand. So we, we start basically from this big Hamiltonian, which contains the free Hamiltonian of the qubits, the free Hamiltonian of the, the fields, uh, which are infinite reservoir of mode, and, uh, and the coupling between the qubits and the modes. And uh, if we input actually a coherent pulse and we trace over the field, what we have for the qubit of uh, evolution are the well-known optical block equations. So again, we'll have 40 minutes talk of Salniak about block equations tomorrow, uh, based on this idea. So um, with these block equations, so you have this term here, which is the classical drive, which induces stimulated emission. And we have this dissipator here, this time this is a dissipator with gamma that is the spontaneous emission. And we have unitary qubit evolution only in the purely stimulated regime where the Rabi frequency here is much bigger than the spontaneous emission rate. So all these are reminders. So this is for the qubit that is printed on the one hand. And on the other hand, for the field evolution, what we have at our disposal are input-output equations. And, and that's it. And you see, we, we, we usually treat the light matter interaction in some sort of a splitted way. What uh, we did uh, in the group, so since uh, mostly when Maria arrived, because she, she really picked the problem and, and brought it, uh, raised it to a well, high technical level, is that we basically closed the one dimensional atom. So the idea is really that now we have developed a way which is based on a, a collisional model uh, where we can treat uh, atom field interaction in a Hamiltonian way. So A is the qubit, B is the reservoir of mode, and our collision model gives us an exact uh, resolution of the light matter closed dynamics 
In other words, we are able to write down the entangled uh, field qubit state, okay, at any time. And for those who are a little bit familiar with the collision model, I'm, I'm opening a parenthesis here. So usually the collision model, it's a, it's a, it's a nice model to to treat quantum open systems because you 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 simulate the bath as a sequence of units that come and interact with your system, and then you trace over these units. What we did here is we didn't trace. So basically, we keep track of everything. So it can be done, obviously, in some specific situations. Uh, well, but who knows? Um, that's the basic idea. So um, this is the principle, just to give you a hint of, of, what is, uh, of what this model is based on. So I told you about uh, modes. Uh, that were characterized by a certain momentum. So we switch representation. Now we have uh, special modes where uh, especially we have a field operator that is uh, interacts directly with the qubit, which gives us a coupling term here in the uh, interaction Hamiltonian. And so this coupling term is transparent. And it's, it's basically telling us that the qubit here that is, that is a James Cummings, but here the mode that the qubit interacts with is the mode that is localized at the position of the qubit, okay? And so what this uh, interaction representation also allows to uh, understand is that whenever uh, you consider modes that are uh, positioned after the qubit or before the qubit, the free evolution corresponds to free propagation of the field. So basically, the only position where something happens is the qubit position, okay? So that's for the basic idea. So you, you and, it's, and it's captured here by this plot. You, you, you can figure out that there are input units. Here, the input units are before the qubit. So what they can do is propagate in the positive x direction. Then they find the qubit, something happens, and then you do have the output units, and these output units, they start to freely propagate as well. So all of this is a story of scattering, basically. And so um, we have derived this light matter entangled state, and then uh, we have to do some consistency checks. And the consistency checks, they are basically what I told you at the corner style, which is we need to uh, find, again, the optical block equations when we trace out the field. And we need to recover input output on average, okay? And um, and that's what we found. So now you can believe me, I hope. And I guess we will see more of that in Sanyak's talk anyway. So um, uh, it's warm to talk. <laughs> so yeah. So now actually that I uh, told you a little bit about the dynamics, we can switch to the energetics. Okay, because the deal here is to study energy exchanges between two systems that uh, form uh, by themselves a, a joint uh, autonomous system, isolated and closed. Yes? I have a question. So here we don't have the concept of dissipated. How can we recover optical block equations from? Because what you have to do is to replace. But so, optical block equations, uh, Need some kind of temperature because it is dissipator basically uh, in light matter interaction, so there is a dissipator. Yes, so true. So, what I'm describing here the exact light matter states that we had it's for a wave guy that is picked up at zero temperature. Okay, okay. so in the, but to obtain the dissipator from this picture, you just have to say that this field that you're decomposing is a thermal field yes. oh. with a certain temperature. Then you trace over its thermal field, yes. then you find that the optical. Then, then it's okay. Then it's okay. Yeah, no, but okay. this is textbook. Right? So, yes. I mean, it's, of course, uh, it's not to say that you should know, but you just text, yes. you can find it, then you will Yeah. Okay, good. Cool. So yeah, now, uh, now what we have to, to, to go back to is uh, actually the bipartite dynamics I told you about at the beginning, because now I hope you are more or less convinced that there is a way to solve the dynamics in a closed manner for the light and the matter in this way that could approach. So we are back to our A and B system with A being the qubit and B being the field. 
And we can go through this idea of effective Hamiltonian and this uh, uh, bipartite work and bipartite heat. So that's the game that we are going to play now. First thing is to uh, revisit the bipartite dynamics in this way, get to a D system. And then we apply the recipe that we did at the beginning of this talk, which is we have our coupling Hamiltonian, we have the total Hamiltonian, which contains the Hamiltonian of the qubit of the field and the chain scannings like Hamiltonian. We decompose the density matrix of the light and the matter uh, into a product state plus a correlation term. And we derive uh, the uh, dynamics of the field using the same concepts as I presented with before, which is here, the effective Hamiltonian induced by the qubit on the field. And here, the not dissipator, which, indu uh, which uh, is induced by the correlations. So now it's interesting to look at the, the expression of the effective Hamiltonian that is exerted by the qubit on the field, uh, which can be written in that way. And what's interesting is just this to comment which has a shape that uh, could ring a bell to some of you because it is nothing but a displacement uh, operator. When you go to the, uh, to the uh, uh, unitary map that is uh, generated by this Hamiltonian, you find that the qubit displaces a little bit the field at each collision. And this displacement really scales like the, the qubit coherences or the, the dipole uh, that is carried by the qubit. So that's one first idea to keep in mind which is already, I would say, an uh, original idea in the sense that we more uh, easily think about the, the, the force that the field exerts on the qubit. But the qubit does something a little bit on the field, and this will have an importance, as you will see. Uh, Alexi, can you yeah. go back? It is, uh, in that first equation there, is it, it should be a row, row B in the commutator, or is it really, you really, really mean row A? It should be row B. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so now um, let's go to look at the local dynamics seen from with the qubit uh, eyes. And so we can look at the effective Hamiltonian that is exerted by the field on the qubit. And it takes this expression here, which is kind of natural because Actually, here we, we recover uh, the complex amplitude of the field at the position of the qubit. So this is more expected, I would say. And by actually solving all the equations, what we find is that this uh, B here, where there shouldn't be a dagger, so uh, Andrew has nothing to say here, there is a mistake in the equation. Uh, this, uh, this local uh, field here, it contains a part which corresponds to the external drive, and a part that corresponds to a term that we call the, the self-drive. And this self-drive here, it appears as soon as the qubit has some coherence. So even if it, in the field is in the vacuum, okay? And so these terms actually, which also should ring a bell to people that are really familiar with, with quantum optics, because this term is expected to be the cause, one of the cause of spontaneous emission. We have translated this in, energetic terms after that. So what becomes the energetic analysis using this uh, BQE framework? I forgot to do a bit, but BQE is for bipartite quantum energetics. So we use BQE now to analyze this, uh, these forces and, and these energy flows. So like I said before, we are in a situation where B commutes with HA and HB. Uh, this may not look obvious to you. I'm going to add a bit of information. We are just going to play with resonant fields here. And with resonant field, you can, you can show that this is true. Um, so we are reading the situation where the atom and the field, they are going to exchange energy in a way that, uh, yeah, there's only the two guys on Earth. And uh, we are also in a situation where the uh, flows of work, they exactly compensate. So what the field does on the qubit, the qubit does it on the field. So we have really action reaction principle in, in, uh, in action here. And so can we go further in the analysis? So what we have uh, computed here is uh, the flow of bipartite work exerted by the qubit on, uh, exerted by the field, sorry, on the qubit. 
And what you can show doing some math is that it takes this very simple form at the end of the day. So here you recognize actually um, the uh, modulus square of the input field amplitude, and here the modulus square of the output field amplitude. What does it tell us? It tells us that if we are able to uh, measure the coherent component of the field, before and after it has interacted with the qubit, we are able to measure the work that the two guys have exchanged, which is very cool <laughs> because work becomes really something that can be measured directly in the battery. Uh, if we say that the field is a battery for the qubit, actually, each of them can play the role because uh, batteries, they are like uh, also symmetrical devices. but. The idea is that really, so now we have this expression that basically tells us that work exchanges, they, they are experimentally measurable through a modern experiment. And uh, so now can we, can we have a nice experiment with that? So what we have looked at, and uh, we are going nearer and nearer the, the experimental plots now, it's a look at the energetics of spontaneous emission. So what is it, the energetic of spontaneous emission? So we have an initial qubit state like this, that as you see, carries, carries some coherence, which corresponds to some initial input uh, of energy inside the qubit by some external source, okay? And this guy is going to spontaneously emit a field, giving rise to a final uh, field state that, well, we have a Hamiltonian process, so the coherence of the qubit get basically maps on the field. If the qubit was, was in the ground state, well, there is no photon emitted. If the qubit was in the, in the excited state, then there is one spontaneous photon that is emitted inside an exponential uh, wave packet, which gives us an energy received by the field, which exactly compensates that change of energy of the qubit. So now we can play a little game. This energy, received by the field, was it received as work or as heat? Work. Work. Heat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you said work and you said heat, is that so? Yeah. What so you put some <laughs> because it depends. <laughs> In French, we say réponse de normal. It depends, okay? And it actually depends on the theta, okay? So let me explain this a little bit. And first, I want to, so I make the poll just to check, because usually I get the sample of answers, which makes me desperate because I totally explained before. <laughs> um, so the arguments that people put forward, usually they are like this. So uh, people would say, well, this is heat because this energy is irreversibly yeah. lost in the bath. Zero temperature bus, so infinite entropy production. So this is definitely heat. There's nothing to do with it. Or work because the field is in a pure state. So it carries ergotropy. So we can get back some work from it. Okay. Reasonable argument as well. And BQE tells you it actually depends. It actually depends because what we are interested in, uh, it's really the way the two guys, they have exchanged energy. So it puts really at the heart of the definition, the process by which uh, they have exchanged their photons. And was it through a force or, or through correlations? And this really tells you if it was bipartite work or bipartite heat. So how can we put that with figures? So like I said two slides before, actually the bipartite work, it is measurable through the change of energy of the field coherent component, okay? So the, the little qubit, it's through the spontaneous emission process, the, the kind of field that, is, that it emits really depends on how it was excited before. And you actually here are what are called the, the Q functions of the field, depending if the qubit started well in the vacuum if the qubit started in the ground state, then the field emitted is the vacuum, so which corresponds to this shape. Then if the qubit was emitted in the, was prepared in the E plus G state, then it emits a zero plus one state, which has this like bean shape for the, the, the field that is emitted. 
which carries some coherence. It's a squid state, but that's, there is some displacement here where we can extract some, some energy from. And this here is a single photon. And the single photon, well, it has no coherent component inside because it basically has no phase. So single photons emitted, they have just given heat to the, to the field. Okay? So that's more or less the spirit. And actually to put that in, in numbers, you, what you only have to do is to compute the change of energy difference, which actually takes this shape, where you can actually put it under this very nice form where you see that the work that is received by the field is exactly proportional to the initial coherence of the qubit. So in this very specific situation, we can actually relate work extraction and quantum coherence, which also has been something that uh, people have chased in, in quantum thermodynamics for a while. So yes, it is only a qubit. And yes, this is specific like matter interaction. But still here we find within a, well, a well-defined framework, this, this kind of, uh, of behavior that was kind of relaxing to, to, to have. And so we also found interesting that well, single photon sources, they, they provide no work, but only heat, which is also some intuition that people had, but uh, that here is, is like clarified. I have, I have a question. Yeah. What, what if you take that system and you put a mirror on the end of it, and so you send that photon back to the atom, can you re-excite the atom perfectly? Yeah. So, that, so then why do you say there's any heat? Because you can extract everything. You can, you can put that exactly right back into the atom and have a perfect reconversion yeah. of energy. So yeah, here actually, like I said uh, on this slide, all these arguments, they are, they are perfectly uh, receivable in the sense that um, it, it really depends on in, in which uh, context you are evolving. The BQE framework is really here to like track the way people have interacted. That's what is carried by the concepts of heap and work. Now, how it relates to reversibility, because this is basically your idea to put a mirror and to try to, uh, to rewind time and to see if the concept of work has a connection with concept of entropy production. So this is something that uh, it could be a follow up. Uh, to connect this to entropy, because right now we are definitely evolving in a purely energetic uh, framework. Uh, that said, in the last part of the talk, I have, uh, uh, so after the experimental plots, we have this theory paper that we have with, with Maria and Patrice, where we address the operationality of the concepts of bipartite work and heat, and we connect this to ergotropy. So it's, it will partially answer your question. But I would say to close this is that very often we, we, we have this uh, outcome that heat and work, they are contextual. So they really depend on the protocol you are, you are playing with. And then you have to shape your concept with respect to what you want to optimize. Basically, that's um, the cautious answer I would give in terms of your spending. But if you, do you have any formula which relates like heat and entropy production? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, welcome. <laughs> no, yeah. Actually, I would also say that this is one of the, the big praise of of, uh, of quantum thermodynamics and quantum energetics in general, in the sense that in thermodynamics you have a natural connection between entropic concept and energetic concept, which is temperature. And now we have exploded the bridge because we we put temperature, we throw it out of the window, so we have to rebuild everything. I'm not sure we'll end up with analytic expressions, but. Uh, I mean, so the optical block equation is specific. We yeah, because we, we have, have temperature. One. Yeah. Because we have a temperature. Yeah. Yeah. But as soon as you, you lose it, then, uh, well, yeah. then you can play like, uh, I forgot his name. Is it Nick Fo? He introduced this effective temperature, Philip Strasberg. Uh, I mean, you can, you can play around this uh, or you, I don't know actually. Here, this is really pure research. Um, one more question about that. Yeah. That's like the maximal work when you have the maximal coherence. Yeah. It's not all of the emitted energy, energy change does not work. So, what what is the maximal work? Is it a quarter or a half? Or? Oh, it's a half. It's a half. Yeah. 
it's a half because at this point you emit well it's so a half of what no uh, the efficiency is half if you define the efficiency as the ratio between the work extracted and the difference in the, the energy range. Yeah. So, it's, so it's a quarter of a and it's a quarter, quarter of h bar omega zero yeah okay so yeah well actually it kind of answers your question because here i so yeah there is this efficiency, so like I said, just defined by this. Thank you. <laughs> and so, if you do the math, it's simply the cosine to the square of theta over two. And now we have this behavior where theta goes to zero. Then, indeed, the work uh, exchange goes to zero, and theta goes to one, which basically tells us that the the, the field emitted by the qubit is becoming more and more coherent, which corresponds to this linear regime where there is only the, the Qubit dipole that emits at the very south pole of the block sphere. Uh, some people have called this this high club regime, whatever. It's it's when actually you don't excite the population, but you radiate a field just with the dipole. Then you have this case where theta is pi over two, which corresponds to the maximal work uh, extraction and an efficiency of 0 0.5. And here, so there is this work and there is also heat. And heat corresponds to the squeezed component of the, of the field. And what we find very nice, I say we, I also tell about the experimentalists we have worked with, is that actually it reveals this heat that there was some entanglement before. So it's kind of a weakness of past entanglement between the atom and the field. Even if they are not entangled anymore at the moment where we detect the field and show there is a squeeze component, it reveals that there was some entanglement in the past as they were interacting. And then what, this. What is actually states of qubit where it, when it is coming to effect with the battery? What is what? Sorry. State of the qubit. Are they in coherent state? Like in what state they are? Oh, these are coherent states. Coherent states. Yeah, okay. yeah. But at the end of the talk, I will show you with single photons as well. Okay. Yeah, because we have some uh, weakness of quantum uh, quantum state of the field that we can play with these concepts of energetic concepts. So yeah, in this, in this situation here, theta equals pi, the work extracted is zero because we have a single photon and uh, the qubit. And this is a signature of the fact that the qubit and the field, they only they have only exchanged energy via the correlation term. Okay? They, they did not induce any force on each other during the evolution. Okay, so here comes the experiment. And so, uh, so this is uh, Pascal. So this was done with uh, quantum dots in micropillars. Uh, Ilse Mayet Dubai was the, the PhD student, uh, and uh, the two theorists, so Maria and Stephen, uh, mostly worked on, on this. And so, and this is still not published. Uh, so, yeah, it's still an archive. This there is no there is no error. And so, this is my experimental style. So, please don't ask questions. <laughs> um, so, the, the idea is that so first of all, yeah, I come back to the title. So the idea is that we have coherence-powered works exchanges between uh, solid-state qubit and light fields. There are two parts in this work. One that actually exactly corresponds to what I've shown you theoretically, which, have, which we have uh, claimed it is the charging of a battery. The qubit is the charger. The field that is initially empty is the battery. And the plots that I'm going to show you right now, they correspond to the first part. Second part was the discharge of the battery, where we basically sent the battery field to interfere with another coherent field and looked at the energy transfers between these two fields via a beam splitter. Okay. And so we had actually to be derived to be derived BQE for a coupling term like a beam splitter. Are you going to talk about this, Anyak? No. So no one is going to talk about BQE with beam splitters. Okay, so well, actually. Yeah, so once you start playing with BQE, you can apply it to a relic that's then we have to show this is a, this matters, but that's another story. Okay, so this is the scheme. So we have the qubit that is inside the micropillar here, and uh, this qubit is excited via this uh, laser, and then it gets uh, so there is spontaneous emission of uh, the field that is. Uh, that is uh, emitted by the excited quantum dot, which plays the role of this quantum battery. And uh, actually, to 
the, 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 the important thing here is to be able to extract the coherent component of this battery and to measure it. And for this, we do a, a homodyne experiment, basically, uh, which corresponds to uh, this uh, max ender interferometer. That, that's what we call self homodyne, actually, and uh, to measure the coherent component of this spontaneous work. And basically, the idea, uh, because there is less control than in superconducting qubits for this, is that uh, these are the phase fluctuations of this signal that give us a visibility. And this visibility gives us a direct access to the work transfer efficiency. And, um, and this work transfer efficiency, it is actually, like I showed before, it is supposed to be cosine to the square of theta over 2. But because of the experimental imperfection, this is modulated by a term that is below 1. And all the experimental challenge to, was to basically measure this term and show that this term is like one, okay? And so that's basically what they show. So that's this visibility, which is supposed to correspond to the work uh, transfer efficiency as a function of this theta angle, which corresponds to a pulse area in the Rabi oscillation uh, excitation that excites the, the one on dot. And as you can see here, it, it nicely goes to 100%. And uh, here, this is the normalized energy. And basically, this helps us to measure this C coefficient, which is a measure of the imperfection, which is very near one. So um, with that in hand, actually, we can rebuild the work and heat, well, bipartite work and bipartite heat energy transfers in this wheel. And so here you have, uh, you have the energy transfer. Uh, towards the field as a function again of the, the theta angle. You have here um, the uh, work transfer, which again is maximal for theta over two. And you have here the corresponding heat transfer towards the field. So what you can see is that it's very close to the theoretical prediction, which for the experimentalists who have their own selling argument tells us that the quantum dot in a micropillar, it really behaves as an ideal one-dimensional atom, and typically uh, the atom here really interacts only with the field and not with the phonons, at least at this temperature. And this is the first measurement of this spontaneous work. And now, to show that this is actually not obvious to get this, they have ruined their experiment, meaning they have increased the temperature. And so you see the effect of increasing the temperature. It drastically reduces the visibility, which means it drastically reduces the work transfer. And why does it drastically reduce the work transfer? It's because during the spontaneous emission process, uh, the guy does not emit a coherent field anymore. It ruins the coherence of what is emitted. So I'm really oversimplifying here, but the basic idea is behind this. It's the interaction with the phonon bath that is now hot that is responsible for this. And so we can measure this imperfection coefficient at 20k, which is not good, and uh, replot uh, the quantities I showed before, now at hot temperature. And we have a strong reduction of the work transfer. And what I want to uh, underline here is that this plot here with the solid line here, there is no fitting parameter. It's really extracted from experimental data and re-injected in the, in the theoretical data. Okay, so this is what time is it? Ten fifty-three. Ten fifty-three. So, are you still with me? You want the last part of the talk, or you are? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yes. So, in this work, like I said before, there are there are other things. Uh, like uh, we have also considered the discharge of the battery, uh, which was really an original theoretical work that we built like ad hoc to understand the experimental data. And um, yeah, this is a conclusion that I'm not sure I want to comment because this is what I'm going to talk about to my colleague. Mm -hmm. So now, actually, I want to go back to theory. And uh, this has to do with Andrew's question. Uh, can we reverse the game? So again, we did not synchronize. Uh, so um, we have this qubit A, which uh, is now the empty battery. 
So we are going to revert the, the role of the, of the charger and the battery. So now it's the field that is the charger and the qubit that is the battery. And uh, the game that we are going to play here is to use our energetic qualities from the BQE framework and to see if we see some differences depending if the field that we inject is coherent or quantum. So comparing like quantum and classical resources and see how it impacts the energy transfers and maybe to extract some energetic witness. And this is like what we did in this, in this paper where we have probed non-classical light fields with energetic weight, with yet. And so, so what is, the, what is the, the spirit of all this? So we have this field that provides bipartite work to the qubit in principle, at least a little bit. And then we are in the business of battery people. So what do battery people? They optimize ergotropy. Ergotropy is really the bread and butter. So ergotropy, it characterizes a, a quantum state, and then it tells you the maximal work that can be extracted from this quantum state, okay? So what we want to do here is to connect this ergotropy concept to the, to the bipartite work and see how they are related. And, uh, and okay, so, and we have addressed that question mm -hmm. again in the specific case of the qubits interacting with the light in a way they could system. So if you are in this context, actually you can have a general expression of the ergotropy of a qubit as a function of its state in the block sphere. Well, Z and R, they are obvious uh, components of the, of the state in the block sphere, okay? And actually, playing with that, here is, here is what we can do. So if we are in the case of a classical pulse, classical here meaning high-intensity input pulse. So there is only absorption that can take place, and the qubit has no time for spontaneous emission. In that case, we are reading the regime where the, the qubit receives only work. And so uh, if it receives only work, the qubit remains in a pure state during the interaction, and all the energy it receives by interacting with the field, it corresponds to some ergotropy input, okay? So we have an exact equality between the work received by the qubit, its final ergotropy, and its final energy. So that's the most simple situation, okay? But now what we want to know, the question that we have addressed is what happens for pulses that contain only a few photons? Now that the guy has the time to spontaneously emit a little bit, or if it's not coherent, if it's uh, like a single photon, what happens? And is there some general relation between work and ergotropy that would be valid at all types? But in this classical case, is, isn't this relevant for fluorescence can happen? Because when you are driving a qubit with uh, high intensity light, coherent light. So actually here, uh, we, we are really looking inside the pulse. So what you mentioned as a resonant fluorescence would be radio oscillation like this, and the light emits photons all around the place. Yeah. But here we are looking at the time resolve situation where we excite, we see the beginning of radio oscillation, and on. So we resolved the, the fluorescence. Okay. It's embedded in the model. And actually, again, here what we are considering is only a few photons so that we can entangle with the vacuum and do all kinds of dirty stuff. So uh, that, that not fits with the resonance of license picture, okay? So here is what we did. So in the classical case, so sorry, with classical resources, so when we send a coherent field, so coherent uh, statistics for the input field, then what we find is what we have called the classical ergotropy bar. And what we find is that actually the change of energy of the qubit can I go to the result? Yeah, I'm going to the result, and then if you like, I can detail this. But the result is that the, the change of ergotropy of the qubit is always upper bounded by the work that the qubit received, which kind of makes sense, right? You, you, the work is your resource. You're trying to, to input some entropy in the guy, and you always have to, to provide more work than the entropy that the guy will finally receive. It makes sense in the in the in the classical realm. So 
In other words, the coherent field cannot input more work than ergotropy. And you can find it by using this sequence of, of uh, reasoning here, which as I'm tired, I'm not going to try to do, but we can go back later if you like. Now I would like to go slowly to the conclusions. Now, if we have a quantum pulse, so if we take single photons, for instance, as an input pulse, then what you have is that there is no effective Hamiltonian because a single photon has no coherence. So the guy produces no work at all on the qubit. But at the same time, a single photon can be fully absorbed by the qubit, or at least give rise to some population inversion, which, which means that at some point, the qubit has received entropy, uh, ergotropy, sorry. So it has received ergotropy without receiving any work. So it corresponds to a violation of the classical bound. And uh, this is something that we sold as an energetic witness for quantum field statistics that can be an alternative to Wigner functions, basically. And that's it. Yeah, so this is the conclusion. So bipartite energetic is a, is a kind of a new framework to define group like and work like quantities within closed and isolated system, where we have this consistency check, which actually also naturally matches with the pictures that quantum opticians have in mind in the classical limit, only work is a chain, and quantum opticians know how to define classical limits. So this, this is natural framework, I would say. And heat, they are the signal that subsystems, they have been entangled in the past. And if we apply this BQE framework to waveguide QD, we have revealed some new fundamental effects, like this spontaneous work, which is the energetic counterpart of the self-drive that also has been long for, known for a while by the, the quantum optics community. And we have energetic witness to probe quantum statistics. And the outlooks, I'm not going to comment, but this is uh, this is the next talk. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you come in more on quantum energetic uh, equivalent of Wigner function? Yeah. So why would you in that function? Because I'm an old quantum optician. <laughs> and you say what about P functions? So that's in global functions. Ah, yeah. No, I picked Wigner functions because it's usually what is put forward to, to probe a quantum field. You find the negativity and you have something that proves you that your field is non Gaussian. That's the only thing I wanted to say. Nothing more elaborated than that. So one situation that we're interested in my lab is somewhat very similar to this, that we can have, if you think about a, a, a subset, subsystem of a large system, so system A, certain circumstances can evolve according to a non-Hamitian Hamiltonian mm -hmm. in a complex energies in a system. Mm -hmm. And so we're interested in how do those, you know, what are the imaginary parts of the energy correspond to in some of a dynamic context? Does your formalism or approach, can that be used to give insight into how we define energy when energy eigenvalues are complex or can be and stuff like that? So to answer that, I would need to sit down with you and you explain to me what is this complex energy counter. Yeah, well, I'll have to think about how, to, how to, exactly what part of that, that is. That would be it, very cool to understand this indeed. Okay. Uh, okay. Is there your work and uh, here are there time integrated concepts? You can have workflows and well, die, but I know that you know people can <laughs> can be out the base with bipartite work, bipartite heat, and uh, yeah, you have the work, the bipartite workflows that you can integrate to have the amount of bipartite work that was exchanged. So you can have it in a time resolved way, if it was your question. Well, yeah, I mean, so it seems like there's such a huge difference between thinking about it in a time resolved way and not, because like, so what I was imagining is that if you started with this excited qubit, right, and then eventually it becomes this like, ground state qubit, right? Yeah. It's, it's almost like very well defined how much energy it lost, yeah. right, in yeah. that case. And in fact, it gets more ambiguous as you initialize it in some, you know, superposition uh -huh. energies instead. Yeah. And I think what you guys had was that the work uh, was zero when you went from excited state yeah, to ground state, yeah, yeah. which is 
um, which I, which, uh, I guess confused me at first because I was like, it seems like here everything is as defined as it could be. <laughs> like, you know, the qubits energy was well defined at the beginning and at the end. Like, I would, you know, and it gave energy to the field. It seems like everything is well defined and that I should call that work. But I understand that if I look at the intermediate times, I guess there's some sort of entanglement between the um, qubit and the field. Uh, yeah, I guess. What is your point? I, I guess my point is that if, if I think, if I just think about it as like, you know, just what is my input, what is my output of the process? Uh -huh. okay. To me, it looks like in this excited state of ground state case that it, I should call it. Yeah. But that's the whole point of picking the time resolved approach, because like I said, we are characterizing processes. How did the guy exchange energy with, which if you think about this, it's very near what's happening in macroscopic thermodynamics as well. It's back dependent, how you define work and things. And it really depends on how they have interacted. Mm -hmm. The BQE carries that, basically. So it's not connected what you can do with your system after. There is there is nothing like that. Yeah. Process like on the disk. Okay, let's thank Lexi again. Very kind.